Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I'm very happy to have Austin Current on the show. Uh, So some of you might recognize Austin, some of you from the big beard probably, because it's pretty pretty outrageous, it's pretty amazing. Um, I wish I could grow such a thing. And also some of you listening might recognize the name, uh, but some of you might not know who Austin is, and I'm really glad to bring him to your attention because I think he's full of great stuff, and uh, I'm really excited to talk to him today and to give a brief summary about kind of Austin and then we'll kind of dig into things a bit more just to kind of yeah wet people's taste buds a little bit he uh, debuted on the physique stage in 2013 so uh he actually went if uh, sorry he got his ifbb pro status however in 2014 which is crazy to think that 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 was the first year I competed as an amateur and I, I did awfully so to think that you went pro when I like had my my kind of uh yeah not great success at that stage <laughs> But to continue, yeah. uh, he has a he earned a degree in exercise science uh, in 2016 and uh, CSCS certification. He is now the co-founder and coach at Physique Development, and uh, recently authored a book, uh, The Science of Strength Training. And so I'm very excited to talk to Austin. You're literally like the perfect guest for the show. You kind of have competed in physique sports, very well educated, um, and you disperse information really well over on the internet. So I'm glad that we can have this chat today. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Man, I, I appreciate it. As as you always do, you over, I think you you set the stage of like, uh, I don't know if you've listened to uh, Nate Bargeski's uh, stand-up, but it, he basically starts out every stand-up with like, you know, where they clap at the beginning and he's like, I think that's the best it's going to get. So it's all downhill from here. Um, no, I mean, thank you for the kind words and the, yeah, it, I've had an interesting go at it. Um, you know, where the beginning of my career, I, I wouldn't in the, in the fitness space rather, you know, wasn't, wasn't the most academic, um, by any means. Like I have never been like a, a person that, that really jive with that world as much, but the, the more I've gone on, like the more I've, I got into the academia of things and, um, more of the research side of just researching side of things, not research. I don't do research, but the researching of things side of it. Um, it's been interesting, but yeah, getting into the the physique world was, was interesting. I kind of got talked into it. Um, you know, it was, it was after it was during, so after high school, you know, after sports, I had a series of, of very traumatic head injuries. And that really changed the trajectory of, of my life in a lot of ways, where I come from a, a big sports family. Um, a lot of people in my family went on and, and played, uh, had successful careers doing other things and, and within athletics and coaching um, within the collegiate level and, and all of that stuff. Like I grew up in a, in a collegiate locker room, like football locker room, like that was my childhood, like breeding, breathing sports, you know, I uh, come from that sort of family and everything was pointing towards sports, sports, sports for me, uh, growing up. And, uh, I thought that was it. I thought that was my ticket. You know, I didn't know what that was going to do, but I, that was, that was my ticket. I thought, and the only way I was really getting into college rather, um, cause I wasn't paying attention to my academics. Right. And so <laughs> in so far that I was able to play rather, and you know, that, that progressed towards, uh, getting, you know, I, I played at a high level at a young age in that around puberty, you know, when you're a 14, 15 year old playing against 18 year olds, um, at a very high contact sport, like, like football or American, American football, like you're liable to, to get, sh- you know, shooken up a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I, a lot of times put my head where it shouldn't have been. And, uh, I think we can see NFL highlights of that. Um, and that got me into some trouble at a young age. You know, I, that kind of changed the trajectory of my sports career a lot. Um, went from sort of that promising future and path to shit. What do I do now? You know, like, I don't know. So I, I made the decision to stop playing. Um, ironically enough, uh, I had during one of my, uh, recoveries from a head injury, I'd watch a 30 for 30 that came out with, um, with ESPN and they were going over some, some traumatic brain injury stuff from the NFL and, and past players and CTE and, and these, 
these long-term effects that head, head injuries have within that sport specifically and in other sports rather too soccer's one or football's one um but you know so i chose to stop playing and i had to sort of re-identify with who i was and, and where i wanted to take things and to kind of fast forward into college um or post high school into into university uh, you know, I just started to kind of casually lift. I was never like a passionate bodybuilder, like in the magazines type of kid. I just never was. Um, but I started working at a gym and you know, I worked at a gym, front desk at a gym for about six years and, um, and then became a personal trainer from there. But, you know, I got talked into competing from a good friend named Alicia. She was, she was like Miss Indiana um, and figure for like two years in a row. And she was like, Hey, I think you'd be good. This was around that time where like Steve cook kind of blew up, you know, okay. and, and took the stage of like the whole men's physique thing, like Matt Christianer, like all these guys in their early days of men's physique. And I was there, she was like, Hey, yeah, try this out, man. You know, I think you'd have a good go at it. And I was just like, no, like no way I, I fought it. I was resisted it. I was like, I don't want to do this. Um, and I just kept lifting. She kind of kept, kept working on it. And I was like, all right, fine. So funny enough, um, she talked me into doing one about six weeks out. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll prep, um, prep at six weeks out here. And that's, this was in 2013. Um, I was 19 at the time. And when I, yeah, when I did that show, um, I ended up winning every class I entered and it was like <laughs> Damn, yeah. six weeks. Well, I remember it. So it was it. so funny because <laughs> it was so funny because my mom, I was sitting, I remember this vividly. I was, I was watching the IFBB pros, the, the men's physique pros go on. Cause they're, they're always the first one to go on at these shows. And my mom looked over to me and said, do you have one of those routines? And I was like, no, she's like, do you think you should get one? I was like, probably. And so I literally was, I made mine, like my posing routine, which thankfully for men's physique is like right, baby yeah. steps relative to bodybuilding, right? Like I didn't have to have music queued up or anything, but you still have to present yourself, right? It, there's still a big stage of the art to, yeah. to physique competitions, right? So I had to learn how to display my physique in, in a matter of like an hour, you know? So um, I, I did the conditioning part. I, I did the get into shape part, but I didn't do the posing part. And so that was a rough, uh, rough go at it the first time. Um, that's just a funny side side story, but yeah, I ended up doing really well in that. And that kind of led me to say like, okay, maybe I should keep doing this. I don't have any other things going on really in my life outside of just going to university, I'm not really into it right now. So like may as well do this, spend all my day at the gym anyways. And so that got me into competing and that you know, led me to do, I think four shows that year four or five shows that year and pretty much got very fortunate one, one, one got went to nationals. Um, and first national I went to got very fortunate again. I think I was at the right place at the right time. And there well, you go. Incredibly humble. Pro card. <laughs> do, and man, I, I really do. I really do think it was the right place at the right time. Like I, I think I do have a, a good physique and I worked very hard oh, in do. that, but, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> But I, I don't know. I, I couldn't do it again now, I don't think, um, especially naturally. I, I don't think I could do it naturally again at this stage um, of where people have gotten like they're yeah. nuts. You know, thankfully, I, I, I got into it when I did in 2013, went to nationals in 2014. And, you know, I, I at least at that time was a comparable size. And funny enough, um, you know, I went up for the overall, which I already won my pro card. It didn't matter, but I went up, uh, ironically enough, I went up, this was when Arash was still in men's physique. Yep. So it was me and him on stage. <laughs> Amazing. And he, he was, I mean, I looked at him backstage and I just, I seriously, I gave him a handshake and said, congratulations, <laughs> Bob, you took this one home. Like you win. Um, cause man, he's a, he's a giant and even more so now. Right. Um, but so yeah, that, that's how, sort of the competing side of things and kind of what got me into that. And then it's, uh, that led me into, after I turned pro, I, I started to like, okay, 
maybe I should take on some clients. And, um, you know, my lifting partner and, and great friend, Alex Bush, we started the company Physique Development and got into coaching online and started doing that like the rest of us, you know, started to do. And so that led me into finishing university, interning for some really cool people, working under some really cool people and kind of got me to where I am today. I don't know if you had any specifics that you wanted to pull out there, but, um, no, it was cool just to, to hear, to hear about your first, yeah, it's just always interesting, like, um, hearing about your first, like walk to stage and how it all went, it sounded very like six weeks out, really positive. You ended up winning everything. Can you, I don't know. You are, look at my own kind of walk to stage and I, I had loads of fat to lose. I was like, didn't know exactly what to experience and I didn't do too well. So like my actually first experience competing wasn't too fun. Whereas actually for you, mm. it's like, it could almost, oh, I don't know if I'd say it went too well, but like it almost went as well as it ever could, which is quite cool. I think it, yeah, I know it's interesting because like I expected this to, and there's some major players and they're like, I expected this to be something I'd worked on for a while. Right. And I don't know, I was almost sort of perplexed. I was, I was sort of confused at how quickly it all happened. Right. And, you know, I say that because I was sort of lost, like nine and a half months in, start competing, decide I'm going to compete. Nine and a half months later, I do what I thought was going to take me years and years, like at least five years. And I planned that in my head. Like, this was my path. This is what I'm going to do in the meantime. Like, I, I do that. Like I ruminate and I like, I make plans and like I, I forecast out and I, I visualize things and that all happened a lot quicker than I thought it was going to. And, and that left me very confused on what to do. Well, where do I go from here? You yeah. know? And I, I competed a couple of times as a pro um, okay. and I had fun. I, I cracked the top 10 in my, my, my first show, which was very cool. Awesome. Um, actually got, actually got docked uh, placings in that first show because they said my shorts were too short. <laughs> it was hilarious. Um, so I, I placed very well actually in that first show. And they came backstage as well. I was going out for finals and said, Hey, we had to dock you a couple places because um, you know, you're showing too much quad. And I was like, sick. This is a joke, right? And they're like, nah, this is not a joke at all. Like, you know, have fun up there. Um, like literally, as I was about to step on stage, and I was like, <laughs> why would you do this? This yeah. is crazy. Why would you tell me this right now? Um, but and then I I competed again. The last time I competed was, wasn't, you know, it was 2016. So it was a while ago yeah. now, um, you know, and, and I've kind of transitioned a bit out of it. I can't say I'm retired. Okay. I can't say I'm done, but, um, you know, I, I don't have anything on the horizon. Have you ever thought about showing off the quads fully and getting into some very small pants? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I thought about making a run, um, more towards a, a classic. Yeah. Um, and I even thought, to so I, I did all my stuff in the I never did anything in the natural federations right and you know I the first show I did was in the NPC I did very well and then every show after that did very well and then I entered the IFBB relatively quickly as a 20 year old kid and I was just like okay I guess I'll if I'm competing with these guys who are you know using PEDs and whatever else like might as well keep up with the, the competition here. May as well just try and, you know, keep inspiring people to, to do this drug free if they can, or naturally if they can, or if they choose to do that, they, they know that you can do it. Um, or it is possible. And, you know, that was a big motivator for me. I got a lot of DMS and, and messages, even at that time of, of people like, Hey, you know, should I do this, this, and this, and, you know, or you're my inspiration for not doing it, which was really cool to me and a yeah. big motivator for me. And, you know, then I kind of 2016 was my last show. And then I got married, I started traveling and, and we lived abroad, a, a, you know, a couple different times. And, um, you know, competing wasn't really on my horizon. But I, even more recently, though, I was, I uh, got inspired. I went to a show, as you always do. And you're like, man, I think I could, I think I could do this. Um, it's sort of like when you, when you go to a game or something, you're like, oh, I could lace up one more time. I'd be, it'd be good. Right. Um, and then, so I, I started looking up natural federations. So I was like, well, let me give this a shot. You know, maybe, maybe I just do a natural federation. Um, and I actually reached out to a couple of coaches. Uh, this was 2019. So I was just like, you know, maybe I do this again. Maybe I just kind of have this itch and, you know, I, I didn't end up doing it obviously, but, um, 
yeah, I can't say I'm, I'm retired forever. Um, but I have thought about it, bringing out the, the yeah. quads a bit more, bringing out the legs. Um, I, I do remember like even in the days of Mint's physique, like I, I remember taking some photos where it was just like, man, I, I do have some striated glutes in right now. I mean, like I was like, maybe, maybe I should do bodybuilding, you know? And then, and then I looked in the mirror and I, or, or I went to the show and I was like, I saw the bodybuilders and I'm yeah. like, no, 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 never mind. I'm gonna stay where, I, you know, yeah. I'm gonna do the mince bikini and everybody can make fun of me, but <laughs> whatever. You know? It's all a pageant. It's all right. <laughs> oh, it's all a pageant. Whatever. Yeah. My, I, when I met my wife, she was just like, cause she doesn't really come from the, the fitness world as much as right. um, definitely we do. Right. So especially this niche bodybuilding world uh, rather. So when she first met me, she was like, okay, you know, she asked me a lot of questions about it. And I've done one show with, when we were together, that was my last show in 2016, we were together, we, we were engaged, and we were about to get married. And, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to at least experience one show with me. Um, and it was funny, because, you know, to her, like, this is so foreign, like when or if we go to a show, it's like, what is that? Like, this is a crazy beauty pageant. Like, this is nuts, you know, and, and she has a lot of respect for it. Don't get me wrong. Um, a lot of respect for it. But she's just so confused by it. She's like, I just don't, I don't get this, you know. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's a beauty pageant. Yeah. So. <laughs> Sounds like my dad's experience. He was like, it was like, this is a sport. <laughs> What's yeah. going on here? Uh, well, my so grandparents, <laughs> my grandparents were there, um, actually almost teared up the other day randomly thinking about um because my grandparents have gone through some health complications recently and kind of you know as you do you kind of reflect on on your experiences yeah. with them and, and whatever else and they were at the show where i've been very fortunate my family's so supportive and my grandparents my my mom um you know all the, all these guys were at when i turned the show where I turned pro at, at uh, the IFBB North Americans in, in Pittsburgh um, and in 2014. And my grandpa, like, uh, like the most stereotypical, like college football coach sort of vibe, right? Um, what you can imagine that is the prejudging for bodybuilding. So men's physique went on after bodybuilding. The prejudging for bodybuilding was six hours long. Wow. And I was like, thinking back to that, my grandma and grand, my, my, my grandparents, my, my parents, like everyone sat through all of this. And I'm so like, after thinking about it, I'm like, I'm so glad I won. I'm yeah. so glad I made this <laughs> worth it. Cause yeah. like, I can't imagine the response I would have gotten if like I didn't win or get dead last or something. And then I'm like, what the hell are we doing here? What is this? <laughs> you know? And I think that's what I was already being said, you know, being said, but um, yeah, I'm just so grateful they were when I think back on it, so grateful they were there because For it made sure. it so much more special, you know? No, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's great. I could talk about this all day with you, but uh, the audience <laughs> probably want a little bit more, uh, I guess, I want to dig into your brain. But something I did want to ask about kind of obviously you talked through kind of the education, how you got to where you are. And it's all, like, I think it's nice for people to know not everyone gets like you're in a really successful position now. It's not like you started when you were like 14 and this is what I'm going to do. It's like no. it very much kind of came to you almost, which is very similar actually how it came to me as well. Um, but in terms of your people who have had a large influence on you um, in terms of like where you are now, like who have been some of your, I know you said you have some mentors and things. I think it'd be interesting for people to know kind of who you worked with or kind of, yeah, what, what influence different people have had on you and uh, where kind of some of, yeah, your experience comes from. Cause I was like, for me, at least it was like, La McDonald, Alan Aragon, 3DMJ, and then I slowly moved up. I mean, before that, obviously, it was all the muscle mags and kind of yeah. not, not great information. But yeah, where where did you come and where, I guess, who who do you look to now? Yeah, so like really early days, really early days. Um, definitely like Steve Cook got me into all of this. Um, huge fan of Steve. And I've actually gotten to work with Steve um, more recently, which awesome. has been really, was a really cool experience for me. Yeah. Like, um, you know, not something I'm going to share a ton about, but like, man, if like, oof, so cool for me. Um, but anyways, early days, Steve Cook got me into all of this, essentially got me over the edge. Like, all right, this is cool. Like this dude's, this is a cool dude, cool guy. Like he's a nice guy, you know, which he is a nice dude. I, I've, you know, he is a nice dude. Um, 
with a great physique, crazy genetics. Um, and then, you know, that kind of got me into the world. And then I was in university at the time. Um, and then, and so I got into more of the, you know, the, the science-based people, you know, the 3DMJs of the world, the Alan Aragons, right? Um, you know, I'm trying to think who else I was really following on those days. I, the, honestly, 3DMJ was such a big inspiration for for me, for us, for for starting physique development. Um, and so they're such a huge inspiration. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if I could say specifically, Helms has been a real, really big North Star for me um, in terms of the the way that he carries himself, the way he sort of puts forth uh, integrity and and sort of just a no nonsense, yeah. but also kind and compassionate way of of distilling very complex topics, but but delivering them in a way where you don't feel stupid for for maybe not knowing them. And and so he's been a huge north star for me, honestly. And um, I've skipped one person who's been huge. Um, Josh Wildeman, I can't go without saying him. So I was in a very fortunate position. And this sort of tells an interesting story of, of my beginning. So I was at a school, I was in one of the situations where I had an extremely overqualified strength and conditioning coach throughout my entire like middle school and high school experience, right? So most typically, at least in the, the US, um, you know, high school football coaches and high school strength conditioning coaches, uh, rather, you know, typically are, are either the head coach or one of the assistant coaches. And, you know, this has probably changed in more recent years, but back in, you know, early mid 2000s, late 2000s, whatever. Um, it was kind of like, you kind of just got the head coach or you got, you know, one of the assistants and, uh, Wildeman Josh was, um, you know, he was, he was a CSCS. He had his, he had his masters. He, uh, U S Olympic weightlifting certified, like you name it, he had it. And I got, to, I've had the opportunity to work with Josh from eighth grade, um, end of seventh, like eighth grade all the way through year 12. And then he actually ended up becoming a professor of mine and a mentor of mine through university. He, he, he started to teach, at the university I went to, which was so crazy. And so he's been a huge mentor for me, um, which no one's going to know who he is uh, outside right. of the people who come yeah. from my world who, who are going to maybe listen to this. But um, but he instilled early, 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 and this is going to kind of where the, the story takes a turn for the, the, rela the relatability sense, is Josh is a huge stickler for exercise technique. Right. And so since eighth grade, exercise technique and being safe and effective within your training has been drilled into me since I was, well, how old are you in eighth grade? 13, 14, 13, whatever that was, becoming a teenager, right? So since like, let's say 13, 12 and 13 years old, that has been absolutely drilled into my head. And so, hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. You know, go through high school. That's still, you know, it's drilled in my head for, for five, almost six years. And then I get to college, which, you know, I'd already been kind of had this concept and idea. And then... You know, I get inspired by the 3 DMJs of the world and, and those guys. And then into university, I actually went down and interned at MI40 gym, right. which yeah. this is where, so I, I spent an entire summer um, down at MI40, and this was for university credit. Uh, so, you know, I went on a limb and asked like, hey, can I, uh, I'm going to come down there. Like, is this cool? Like for this, this day to this day, like, cause I'd already, I'd had some coaching from them. Okay. Um, you know, I had some coaching from, from Kasim and, and those guys down there and back when he was still doing that. And <clears throat> so I went out on a limb and just asked, and I, I, I was very persistent too. Cause at the beginning they didn't answer. 
uh, about anything. And so I was like, hey, can I do this? Hey, can I do this? Um, and I actually even got, an, funny enough, I even got an extension from my advisor at university for the due date of telling them where I was going. Because um, I'd also interned before at St. Vincent Sports Performance, which okay. if you guys are familiar with like uh, like Mike Robertson, yep. um, like those guys. So like we're talking like those type of people, more strength conditioning world. Um, and they did like NBA, NFL players and like those okay. type of people. So I'd interned there before. Um, that was earlier on in university. But I really was interested in like more of the physique training, the bodybuilding world, the body composition world, and more of like the hands-on personal training. And so, you know, in my 40, especially back in 20, this would have been 2015, 2016, you know, everyone was still there. You know, you had everyone there. You know, you had Joe, you had, or you had a hypertrophy coach, you had Joe Bennett, you had uh, Adam, Adam Miller, Bryce Baum, you had Kasim, you had Ben Pakulski, you had, you had all these guys under one roof, right? And so I, it was there during that time. And it's sort of like the sort of a golden age of, of absorbing information, yeah. right? A golden age of shadowing all those, all these people um, for an entire summer, every, every single day, six days a week, at least if not seven. And um, that led me into a lot of cool things, you know, and then I started working for uh, in 20, late 2017 throughout 20, 2018 and into early 2019, I worked for N1 as a, as a coach and an educator. So for those who aren't you know familiar, that's kind of coach Kasim Hansen and, and those guys at N1 who do a lot of, do a lot of cool stuff um, on sort of the, the front lines of innovation uh, of, of a lot of nuance, you know, within this world. And so I worked for them for, you know, a good chunk of time and, um, you know, I've since left and it went back to the physique development company that I helped start uh, back in 2014. But um, yeah, 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 those are some of the people that have really had a, obviously there's been more sense, but like, yeah, those are some people that definitely stand out in the early days who sort of shaped, you know, a big way kind of who I am and, and as a coach and someone, how I absorb information and, and what I think about. Right. And yeah. there's one thing I can put together from. Uh, what I would say a, a huge commonality between Eric and or Eric Helms and Kasim is they're both critical thinkers. Like they're really good at critically thinking about topics in a maybe in a more nuanced way or maybe a way than we've once thought about them. And so being, you know, either being absorbing information from like a guy like Eric or sort of like trying to find everything he puts out um, throughout my career and then like being sort of a you know, a right-hand man or, or more of a number two under Kasim in that way. It's like, yeah, man, like you're exposed to a lot and you get to, to critically think about a lot of different topics in a lot of new ways. And it sort of reframes the way you consider and think about topics, yeah. even topics that you may have learned and have been drilled into your head one way. And you're kind of like, huh, how about this way? Well, let's think about it this way. You know, how does that change the narrative? And, um, so that's been interesting. Those are some guys, though. That's really cool to hear because actually I wasn't aware. I knew you'd worked with some of these people, but I wasn't aware that you were interning at that gym under like, because Joe's been on the podcast. kasim has been on the yeah. podcast. Uh, obviously, haven't had Ben Pakulski on um, and maybe Adam Miller will come on, but it's it's crazy to hear kind of, yeah, I mean, and I know how much of an influence that can have because I've had the opportunity, like I know we've had Mike Isretel over for seminars and I spent a day or a couple of days with Mike, like just with him. It's just crazy. Not even necessarily they're teaching you things, but you just watch them and how they are interacting, thinking about things, talking. And it's funny just how much you pick up just from that shadowing. So I can't even imagine when you had all of those kind of really smart dudes with tons of experience for an entire summer, <laughs> how much you oh, picked man. up. It's, it's unfair. <laughs> like when I think about it, like it's an unfair advantage. It's, it's something I really don't talk about, but man, if it, if it's not been a, a very unfair advantage in terms of, cause I also had a very good university experience and, you know, I have a strong sort of educational background in uh, sports science and, and strength conditioning more in the athletic side of things. Um, that's since waned a little bit, um, since I've dug into the physique world more, but, um, you know, so I come from all these different places, right? Like I'm, I'm, 
really mentored and brought up in the evidence-based world and the circles of evidence-based um, of what we know of the evidence-based community. And then I've also spent a lot of time with, with people who still utilize science and, and allow that to drive sort of the nuance forward more into this bodybuilding physique world. And so I like to say, I, I kind of live in the middle of those two things. Um, you know, obviously evidence-based and, and science-driven, but you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance, right. And there's a lot of, a lot of things that would have to be considered and especially in context to each individual. So I'd say I, I, in a large way, sort of live in the middle of those two extremes of yeah. things, um, which is, I think helped me out. You yeah, know? no, for sure. And I think that's why uh, I was drawn to you and your work because it's clear that you are evidence-based. You think about things critically and I can see the influence of those individuals as well in terms of like your content, even where you are very much about like instructional videos and things over on Instagram. I know I, I followed those for ages and they, they're great. Like the, uh, and I think that's, people really appreciate those as well. Those little snippets that can actually help people. They can save people from injuries or they can start feeling an exercise slightly better, uh, which is really cool. And I know um, in a kind of, we we're going to talk about this eventually was your book that is going to be coming out very, very shortly. And by the time this podcast is out, it should be available for everyone in the UK, everyone in the, the US. I'm excited to get it because at least for me, when I was learning about like technique and execution, a lot of it initially came from just watching other people uh, watching YouTube videos and things like this. And I kind of self-taught a lot of like the old movements. I got qualified as a personal trainer. Can't say a lot, I learned a ton about how to actually execute movements there. And maybe actually was taught some false things. And I think there's a lot of personal trainers listening, a lot of the coaches listening. And then they just learn from like the likes of 3DMJ or people putting out good form uh, and things like this. But there's no kind of like, uh, I, I guess I picked up like starting strength and uh, Mark Ripito went yeah. over like the squat bench deadlift and, got drawn towards powerlifting. I think 3DMJ also had an influence on like powerlifting and lifts like that initially, like very much initially and still now. Whereas now it's like taking that through to bodybuilding. And I think probably BPAC was a big influence on like taking it further there and trying to find like a, a resource, like a textbook or something to learn about these sort of things is something I think a lot of the listeners have been like, this is something I kind of want. And I, I spoke to you about how the kind of resource I'd always looked at for this sort of thing was, I have it here, the strength training anatomy. Uh, and it, it's a fine textbook and it ha there you go. That's the, <laughs> I got it. I got it right there. So there you go. Free advertisement I mean, for you. It, it, it's a free text uh, with, yeah. um, it's free text. It, it's a great text and like to show things off and, but it doesn't really go into the amount of depth that people really want. And I know yeah. your book um, and you kind of said it's written for the general person. So a lot of people listening might think this is going to go way over their head or something, but very much written for the general person, but also applicable for coaches to kind of explain things a, a little bit more succinctly or just to be able to see an exercise and when people talk about lengthened and shortened, uh, I know I've seen some kind of clips of that, thankfully, uh, Austin sent them across and I'm excited to get the book myself, but people kind of, you hear these things, but sometimes just seeing a picture and an image and um, I think the text is going to be super helpful for people. And I guess my first question is going to be with the book, what was like for you, what's the, what's your favorite chapter? Which was your favorite to write? Which one are you most like proud of? Yeah. Um, Man, because it's it's such a so you know it's it's over two hundred pages, and there's only four chapters. So each chapter is pretty long. Yeah. Chapter two is the strength exercises chapter, um, more or less going through. As you said, like you have like starting strength and in these type of of books that really honed in on the big three, right? Squat, bench, deadlift, and you know, I, with this, it was more of an, an idea of, okay, well, let's give people a resource that have, you know, we, we represent over a hundred exercises in this book, 33 main exercises, like your squat, your bench, your deadlifts, your overhead presses, your, your hack squats, your, your back squats, your leg presses, you name it, right. It's in there. And then there's variations. There's three or four variations of each main exercise that are represented telling you a good viable way of, of utilizing that within your programming, um, how to exercise, how to use that exercise, how to perform that exercise, um, what that should look like, the muscles it trains. Um, so if you're looking for like, you know, way of, of kind of spicing up your, your exercise selection a little bit, it, you can go to that, 
that section, right? So in the strength in chapter two and the strength exercises chapter, you can go, they're broken up by a muscle group where at the, the start of every muscle group, there's an anatomy overview. Um, there's an anatomy overview that teaches you about the anatomy in that muscle group, all the different divisions, all the different things we're training. And then there's text to support that image telling you about muscle actions, telling you the, the need to know information about that anatomy. That way you're not just, because that, that was very important to me that we didn't just show a picture of the anatomical man, right? Front and back and list all of the muscles and didn't give any context, didn't give any, any, yeah, any context to the information that was, was in the chapter to follow or in the information to follow. So in that overview, um, you're getting exposed to that anatomy. So it should be a really good resource to learn the anatomy. It should be as far as textbooks go. And then it should be a really good resource to talk, talk to you about the need to know the important bits, the, the muscle actions, the, the things to think about when you're utilizing these or trying to train these muscles. And then we get into, you know, the muscles used, um, you know, if they're lengthening or shortening under tension, if they're in an isometric during this exercise, which phase concentric or eccentric, you know, um, and more of like kind of the bigger picture of why you'd maybe use it. And then all the variations. Um, so that's chapter two. That's a, that's a huge chapter. That's a big part of the book. Um, the chapter one's all about physiology kind of takes you into, to, you know, exercise physiology, muscle physiology, a bit talks about, um, muscle growth. How do, how do a muscles, how do muscles grow? How do muscles receive tension? Um, and what does that tension do? And, um, how does that drive a stimulus forward for muscle growth to, to happen? And, you know, I, I was very excited, you know, using like Eric Helms's research and all these different guys as research throughout this book is, is, and I was very fortunate. They came out with that new model of, you know, new model of hypertrophy yeah. this year. Cause I was just like, oh, this is a valuable resource for this book, man. Um, you know, there's so much, so much great research that came out in, in 2019, 2020 that I was like, man, you know, thank you guys. Cause this made this so much easier. And my goal with this book was to create a well, very thoroughly researched resource for people who don't want to get into the weeds of a very nuanced topic just to learn some of the, the valuable insights of, of the science behind strength training, right? So, you know, like Schoenfeld's book, excellent, very deep, yeah. uh, you know, very thorough in terms of its research and its science base but it is very into the weeds of muscle growth and hypertrophy, right? So if you're not like bought into that, or you're not like the only thing on your mind is it muscle growth, which I don't, you know, shouldn't always be. And not everyone strength trains to grow muscle or to like be as big as they can be, right? Obviously it's a quite a good side effect um, and a, a great thing for your health. But, you know, I, I want to create a very well, you know, thoroughly researched book on just the general topic of strength training. You know, what does it do for, our health, what does it do for our mental health, our physical health, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, you know, diabetes, neuroplasticity, like brain health, whatever, you know, yeah. um, preventing neurodegenerative diseases or helping starve off um, some of those, some of those things into to later life, right? So resistance training and strength training is, you know, the most effective standalone sort of strategy, exercise strategy for, for counter counteracting the age related loss of, of muscle mass strength. Um, power, things like that as you age and, and throughout your lifespan. So how can we kind of give that resource to everyone in the general public? And, you know, there wasn't really a book that, uh, that did that. There wasn't really a book that was as general, but thoroughly researched and, and evidence-based and, and really science-driven in that way. So that was really the, the, the goal of the, of the book, but, um, I think they're all my favorite chapters. <laughs> you know, it's hard. I like yeah. sort of circumventing your question, but no, it um, the most challenging to write, I think, was probably the most fun I had was the physiology chapter. I really like physiology. Um, they all took forever to write, um, but because I worked on this for a year, so like this took a year to put together. Um, so to do all the research, the writing, the, the editing, the revisions, um, all the illustrations in the books, the book's very visual yeah. as well. So it's kind of like a, the best merge between a science-based textbook, 
um, the application components of like the muscle and strength pyramid books and the visual reference for anatomy from books like strength training anatomy that we showed earlier, you know, yeah. um, but yeah, I don't know if there's a favorite one. No, it's, it's yeah. fine. I mean, like you said, there was actually only four, cha- like normally chapters that, like that length or that, yeah, that long have like eight. Yeah. There's only four, or, <laughs> like, um, at least physiology, strength exercises, injury prevention. So preventing injury and how to like work around injury and like return to strength training from injuries. Yeah. You know, so I talk a little bit about, um, you know, I get into the science of warming up and, and cooling down and, um, you know, maybe some, some more nuance around stretching, um, that you, which is in the research, you just have to kind of make sense of it, um, without reading the one side or the other. Um, and there, there's some useful practicality uh, to to some of those things, um, and then, yeah, the fourth chapter is program design. So principles of of program design, and you know, talking about volume, talking about uh, exercise selection, uh, fatigue management, and and you know, all of those things, and yeah. and how to put that into a program uh, that you can either build yourself, or there's example programs in the book, uh, there's a muscle building program, beginner and advanced three days, four days, and five days a week. There's a strength program in there for one designed for beginners, one designed for more advanced people, three and four and five days a week. And then there's a strength endurance. I just wanted to use a term that people recognize, but think muscle endurance, think, you know, that sort of ballpark, um, uh, more metabolic training, more ben- metabolically driven training rather. Um, for again, beginners and advanced three, four, five days a week. So there's a ton of programs in there and hopefully with the tools from chapter four, the text, um, that I was able to, to make sense of extrapolate from the research and also put in with my experience of teaching the stuff in seminars and teaching the stuff online and, and teaching the stuff to my clients, um, trying to put all that stuff together and, and sort of put it in a way where. I had kind of two people in mind when I wrote it, where it was kind of like that person that walks into like a Barnes and Noble or that person who's getting on the internet to maybe learn more about, you know, they're interested in strength training or they know they've heard that strength training is really good. How do I learn more about it? You know, I, maybe I'm a little intimidated by going into the gym without being more educated about it. Um, you know, what, what resource can I create that really covers that gap of what a four-year degree theoretically should give you, but doesn't always, um, or even those personal trainers who are just getting into things and, you know, maybe their degree isn't in exercise science, or maybe it is. And, you know, a lot of stuff that I wrote in the book, like I had, I learned after my university experience, yeah. right. Um, I definitely brushed over a lot of these topics, but again, like in a, in a university age of, of, kind of where we're at, it's, I'm pro education. Yeah. Make that out. I don't think college is a waste of time. Lots to learn in college about yourself, that work ethic, about discipline, teamwork, things like that. Um, made me who I am, but it's, it's one of those things where we're very much in this, this sort of learning culture of, is this on the test? You know, it's like, if it's not then yeah, whatever, you know, I'll, I'll learn it later and you'd never do. Um, you know, or people that, that, you know, got into personal training after, you know, maybe getting a different degree and they're super passionate about it. Um, but they want a resource that they can get that sort of distills everything for them. And there's a giant bibliography in the back of all the references. So you can go look up everything after the fact, if you'd like. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. Yeah, I think um, it's so great for someone like myself, like I don't have a university degree within like exercise science or something. I, I kind of came across all of this and became incredibly passionate about it after the fact, uh, which I kind of I mean, you can't, I don't regret it. I've got here and I'm here now, mm-hmm. but it's amazing that these resources are available. Like you said, the muscle and strength pyramids, there's Brad Schoenfeld's book. There's going to be this book now, Renaissance periodization. They have all their textbooks yeah. as well. And it's like, 
these are ultra specific. Like I was always, I remember when I first got into it, I was looking for all these kind of like ones that are a bit more specific to what I was trying to achieve. And a lot of them are great, like just like general, like strength and athletic, like textbooks and things like this. And like you said, Mark Ripito, I mean, he had, I had practical programming from him and obviously strength, uh, his strength training textbook that taught through those lifts, but to have something. Starting strength, of, yeah. Yeah, starting strength, that's the one. Uh, so to have this now, which is a little bit more specific. And I think particularly I just, I get asked regularly from people like, what's a good anatomy textbook? And I'm like, I actually have looked into it myself and I look into these textbooks. I'm like, it's just so much stuff in there that I'm just like, uh, that is maybe not super applicable to what I'm trying to learn in terms of just muscles, in terms of like the, the lengthening, the shortening, which muscles are being used, that sort of thing, which is what people are after. They're not looking for like, I don't know, just like a crazy anatomy textbook that's like 600 yeah. pages long and it's just like overwhelming with information. So, so like, if you guys want to get into the weeds, <laughs> This is the weeds, man. Like I use this a lot within writing the book. Um, extremely dense, extremely technical. Um, but I'm hoping that my book lives. The books fell on my bookshelf. I'm sh I'm hoping my book bridges the gap and like lives there where you my go. face is. Right. I hope it's sort of the in between of great drawings, little substance in terms of practical. You know, written text in this book. Unfortunately, there, there just isn't. But the pictures are great to look at. Um, and then this book, good luck. You know, um, good luck with that one. Um, but I'm hoping it it sort of lives in there uh, yeah. as a as a practical and useful, you know, well researched book for someone yeah. to maybe bridge that gap, right? Because my book doesn't have all the answers. It doesn't have everything that you'd ever need. That wasn't the point. But it was the point to sort of fill the gap of something that I thought, you know, something that we thought in terms of the publisher as well was, was lacking, you know, in, in the, in the space. So we're hoping. I, I for sure think like, I just, I know it's going to be the, the kind of the book a lot of people have been looking for. And I guess at least if they want to get into the, the weeds eventually, at least they can start with something that's a little bit more like on their level, a little bit more palatable for them now, rather than getting yeah. straight into the deep end, which is great. Yeah. Um, something might be interesting to actually just dive into, because you mentioned it, and I think people listening might have been like, oh, that sounded interesting, was the stretching. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about kind of what you wrote about within uh, the text about stretching. I know a lot of the listeners will be kind of like, uh, like, I don't think it does too much or like static stretching in terms of mobility or avoiding it pre-workout, particularly things like that. Um, yeah. What, what did you get into on stretching? Yeah. Let me try to look for some of the, um, stuff that I put into the book here. Uh, I, I think this is due to head injuries, but my memory is, <laughs> is, uh, is no bueno. This is so. why I, I have a head injury as well. That's why my my memory for names and things like this. Oh, are just dude. Dates. Yeah, I, I can't got notes do it. here. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I'm not a person that can tell you again, there's a tons of studies in the bibliography of the book, but I am not the person that can rattle off, you know, Brown and colleagues, like not like men. I, I don't remember at all. Um, I read the full study, but couldn't tell you now. Um, but anyway, so in terms of like what I put into the book, it was one of those things where I just wanted to simply answer the question of, you know, s static stretching, you know, is it harmful? Is it useful? Okay, cool. And it's one of those things where, you know, short duration stretching five to 30 seconds uh, can be beneficial in addition to a warm up routine. This is what I was able to find and sort of make sense of within the literature. Um, and this has been shown to positively impact and, and reduce risk of, uh, like musculoskeletal or uh, tendinous related injuries and increase readiness before a workout, right? So, and it's also one of those things where if you enjoy doing this, and this is sort of a mental prep period, that's mental prep time for you in terms of, because one of the biggest parts of a warm up, right, is increasing readiness, increasing body temp, increasing readiness yeah. to train, visualization of maybe that day's lifts. Um, or whatever you, you're going to do in terms of any, anything psychological, if stretching something you enjoy and it brings you some sanity and it allows you to almost have some mindfulness before you train and sort of calm down and ease into the lifts, as long as you're keeping things within a shorter duration between five to 30 seconds, but even like what I was able to find in the research is 
you know, I have this sentence here, acute short duration static stretching lasting less than 45 seconds has shown to not negatively impact strength and performance. Longer duration stretching last or lasting longer than 60 seconds has shown to negatively impact strength, power, and performance, right? So, and also like there's, there's some argument, there's some counter argument to is static stretching, how static is static stretching? Right, yeah. Especially acute static stretching, like how static is that, right? Because anyone who, and I am not the most limber individual, so anyone who, you know, if I go down to touch my toes, that is not static. There's a lot going on in my <laughs> posterior chain. My hamstrings are like, yo, quit. You know, like we're po- like <laughs> we're we're snapping cross bridges here. Like there's muscle damage about to be had on on this. Um, but you know, there's so there's that kind of argument too, right? So, and then there's sort of the dynamic stretching um, in terms of kind of being a mode of, of an active warm up. But again, how static is static stretching? Um, especially if it is short duration, you know, so it's not like, again, it, this is really a, a don't throw the baby out with the bathwater situation um, that I think we just like black and white answers. We like very, yeah. we like sides, we like teams, we like things to make the most sense on what sort of maybe confirms our own bias or whatever. Um, and that's not a negative thing. I think that's a useful tool in in many ways, but also I think it gets lost in more of the intellectual side of our lives, right? I think in a lot of psychosocial situations, a lot of that does make sense from like an evolutionary perspective. But when we get into like the information age and and where we're at now and losing a bit of the nuance and a little bit of the context um, within the entire situation, it's it's one of those things that, um, yeah, I think the context is lost. So yeah, that's kind of the, the stretching bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's so true. People love, like, they love teams. They love black and white answers. Like, And I, I even find myself doing it sometimes where I'm just like, don't do that. Like, it feels it's much easier to go towards that, but it's not. So it's nice, yeah, that within the text, like you said, uh, you haven't just given your opinion on stretching within the textbook. It's like evidence-based things and practical information that you can take away. Yeah, and there's plenty of... Like at the end of this chapter, there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. There's about 45 references to 45 to 50 references for the this stretching, preventing injury chapter. Um, so, you know, chapter three, there's about 45 to 50 references that you're you're welcome to dig into. Um you know, get a magnifying glass because the bibliography is rather small. We ran out of room. Uh, I remember sending over, I sent over the first half of the bibliography and or the refer, the references. And um, he, the, my publisher, my editor was like, okay, great. Thank you so much. And because uh, it fit perfect. And uh, so I sent over the next like spread, the next info or the next text uh, how I had to like write the book was pretty interesting um, and send, you know, send it over and get approved and edited and whatever else. And I go, Oh, by the way, here's the other, here, here are the other half of the references. And they're like, Oh, we don't have, we don't really have room. And I was like, you got to make room. <laughs> I was like, these reference, these are referenced in the book, yeah. like room, there's room, like make the room. Um, and so the the the, bibliog- the the references are rather small. So you may need some reading glasses or a magnifying glass, but they are there. Um, so unless you you know if you have good eyesight, you can you can check them out. Love that. And actually, that's a question: Is this book uh, only hard, uh, like softback, or is it ebook, or how, how can people pick it up? Is it available? How is it available? Yeah. Um, so it is in paperback. Uh, that's a that was one thing that's that was super cool to me. There's two cool things about this book for me. There's a lot of cool things, but. Um, to me, at least two things, the book is a book book, like a physical book you can hold in your hands. That was important to me. Um, so it's in paperback and a flex bound. So it, it's, it's also very thick pages. It's very well made. Um, and so, yeah, you can have it and hold it in your hands. And then there is an EPUB copy. There is a Kindle version. Um, I don't think that's out yet on Amazon or anything like that. And what I will say, like, if you look at, if you look at the, um, 
the reviews of other books similar to this. And, and I will say, honestly, on this, this podcast, if you really are interested in the book, get the paperback, get the physical book, because the way it's designed and written and displayed aesthetically, the book, you need the physical book because this is not a Kindle friendly book. There is a Kindle version. Eventually it's going to come out. But like, if you look on Amazon with, cause there's other books sort of similar to this, like about science of yoga, or science of running. There's other in this, and there's sort of a series of books from this publisher. And I'm, I just happen to write the strength training one. Um, if you look at those two books, as I do, I, I do some research and all of the one star reviews have nothing to do with the content or materials inside. Right. It has everything to do with one star. Do not buy the Kindle version of this book. That's all it says. And it's like, great. It's in a world that make or we're made or we we're, we make or break. That's hard to say. Apparently, um, we're broken by reviews. Essentially, like you know, five star reviews versus a one star review. And if all the one stars reviews are pulling you down in terms of your book ratings, but it has nothing to do with the context, the the contents of the book. That's kind of tough. So yeah. what I will say to everyone um, who's listening to this podcast, um, if you have the capability of buying the the the, the paperback, the flex bound, the, the physical book, do it. Um, and the second cool thing to me is this book is $19.99. I was going to say, it's not it's expensive. It's $20. Um, that was the coolest part to me. And this book will be translated into different languages, um, which is... I guess a, a third thing, um, a third thing that's very cool, but the fact that it's $20 and so accessible to everyone who needs it, um, is just, that, that means everything to me. Uh, I get a lot of DMS from, especially people from, uh, from other countries, other continents where the exchange rate is not favorable. And I, I'm really lost in how to help them. Yeah. You know, cause I can't sit on my DMS all day. I can't just sit here and, and I just can't do it. You know, you can't do it either. We can't do it. We don't have time for that. I try to make some time, but like, we just don't have time for it. And it's one of those things where I was like, man, I wish one day I could have a resource that could be translated and also practical and useful, but also affordable and damn trifecta. Here we go. You know, I'm excited about that. That that's super awesome, and it's great to hear that that was so, such an important thing to you. Um, again, it just yeah it speaks to your character a lot and everything. But uh, it yeah, I, I saw the price initially when I, I saw someone else actually share it, and then I, that's how I found it. Um, okay, so cool. like I saw the price, I was like, man, that's a like for what's involved with this book, that's a un, like an unbelievable. And I was like, is this an ebook? And I was steal. like, it's not even an ebook. It's like a no, it's, it's a, a physical book. book. <laughs> yeah, it's a proper book, and. It's well made, like again, very thick pages. It's it's the binding is good, so like it's worth every every bit of twenty dollars. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would just really encourage you to to get the physical copy if you can, um, and yeah, make highlight it, mark it up, do it, man. Um, do what you got to do with it, yeah. but you know, get some use out of it. And I definitely I have to agree when I get these sort of books that are I don't know they're, they're books I really want to look at at multiple times if i have it as an ebook i'm at my screen all day anyway or i'm on my phone or people are like that so having a physical copy is just nice you can actually take yourself away and like give yourself <laughs> to the if you got like a huge bookshelf <laughs> I thought yeah that's what oh, you were I grabbing. Yeah. <laughs> Not, text dude yeah textbook after textbook yeah just bookshelf books after book so but so i one thing that I like like i own brad's book um yeah brad schoenfeld's book but it's on this thing dude and his book is not Kindle friendly. I will. I mean, it's, it's way more Kindle friendly than mine is, but like, I, it's pretty Kindle friendly. I lied. Mine is, I don't think it's going to be very Kindle friendly, but his is okay. Um, but I have it on my Kindle and I, I referenced that book for some of the material in my book and yeah. I'm on my Kindle, like this yeah. close trying to like highlight, trying to zoom into some of the photos. Uh, and I was just like, this is terrible. Like, why didn't I just buy the physical book? Like, so let that be a lesson. I, <laughs> yeah. And in, in terms of textbooks and these type of books, like I do read stuff on my Kindle, but like not that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So yeah, I think 
in a roundabout way, we've got to a good kind of end point here. Mm -hmm. uh, if people want, obviously, if they want to pick up the book, uh, which I, I hope a lot of people do, is it just Amazon? I, I've got, I'll make sure it's in linked below, but is it just Amazon that it's available? Um, it's on Amazon. That's probably the easiest place to get it. Okay. Um, it's also at uh, Barnes and Noble and it's on Barnes and Noble online. Um, it's books a million online. Um, so it's at books a million. It's at Barnes and Noble. Uh, it's on target.com. So it's at target. It's at Walmart. Wow. Um, so if, if you want to go to Walmart and get it, it's there. So cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, at least online, I know for sure. I don't know physically, but I haven't seen it physically cause it's not out yet, but like, I'm hoping I can walk into a Walmart and yeah. it's there. Um, that would be super cool. But it, yeah, like Amazon's definitely the easiest place. But if you guys want to buy it somewhere else, I understand. Um, so barnesandnoble.com, booksamillion.com, IndieBound is a place as well if you want to more support small indie uh, bookstores. And Target and Walmart both have it as well. So Very really cool. no excuse not to get it. It's the same price pretty much everywhere. Um, under a $20 book. Well, 20 with shipping and taxes and stuff, but who's counting? Um, yeah, that's that's where you can get it if you want. But Amazon's definitely the easiest place. Yeah, I think especially here in the UK, I know it's on even like it's on our Amazon. I think it may, I think you even said it comes out earlier. So um, it but, does, but, the eight. Yeah. So the publisher, it's actually a London based publisher. And so ah. it, it, funny how I had to write it. So um, I wrote it obviously in American English. Which, if you've ever spent a, if you've ever spent time around different cultures, like we had a really good friend group when we lived in Australia, there was a, a British couple, there was obviously an Australian couple, and there was us, my wife and I, and we're at this table, we're at a table, we had a weekly taco night, and a taco and margarita night, uh, which I miss dearly, um, and we were having this conversation, and it was so funny because, if, seriously, for five to ten minutes we were trying to explain what we meant. We were trying to like, <laughs> we were trying to make a, like a, some sort of comparison to something. And like, no one could understand anyone. Like <laughs> the, the, you know, the British people could understand the, the Australians, the Australians could understand the Americans, the Americans couldn't understand the British. It's like, and we were good friends. And it's like, we were trying to say all the same thing, but we couldn't communicate it. And so if you all think it's, if you think it's all the same, it's, it isn't, um, it's very, very close, but it, there are some intricate iterations, um, and different dialects, even in English for sure. Um, but so I had to write it in American English and then I sent it, um, over to the UK and it got put into British English and then it had to get sent back to the U S their U S office to be re-Americanized. <laughs> to then be sent back to the UK. And I was like, man, this is bureaucratic nonsense at yeah. its finest. Like, wow, this is, this is so inefficient. That's and we had, I had to, all my deadlines were based off of all of the proofreading and changes that had to be made into British English or American English um, for the first two copies. And then obviously they're going to be translated um, into a few different languages as well. But um, we're not quite at that stage, I don't think yet, but um, yeah, that was just a funny thing. Uh, but the, Lund the publisher is London based. And so that is why the book comes out on April 8th uh, in the UK. And in the North American countries, they uh, the book comes out April 20th. Um, cool. So that's kind of why that's the case. That's yeah, it's, it's, it's hilarious. So funny though. I, I yeah. end up using American English more than I should, considering I'm English English. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you think that's because of social media a bit? Because you hear more American people speak. Yeah, yeah. I, most people I end up talking to, especially on the podcast, like majority of people oh, are Americans as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I read these textbooks, they're all in American anyway. So yeah, yeah okay. I just end up and like watching friends and things like this. I just Americanize yeah. myself in every way. Sure. Um, but yeah, the Aussie English is amazing sometimes <laughs> dude it's far out man yeah. like some of the yeah just some of the different dialects you even get within australia yeah. like whether you're from you know yeah i'm not even going to go into that but <laughs> yeah it's it's um it's wild so we've spent time we've lived in england and we've lived in australia and obviously we've lived in america as well um and they're all that they're all different yeah. english you know they're all it's all different english for sure and we scratch our heads sometimes we're just like 
I, it's kind of like finding Nemo. It's like, I really want to understand you, but I just can't like, you know, it's, it's just like, man, I'm trying so hard to understand what you're trying to tell me in my language, but like, I'm just not there. If you could draw a picture, like this would be easier. Um, um, yeah. Amazing. And so if people want to follow you, um, yeah. check out your coaching, everything like that, where should they head as well for that? Yeah. So, um, I hang out on Instagram quite a bit, um, probably more than I should, but that's Austin current. Um, if you type in Austin, a U S T I N, um, it's the big bearded dude that comes up. Um, and then, yeah, if you guys are interested in just checking us out, uh, we are coming out with some really cool stuff, uh, in the n- near future, um, this next month or two, uh, that's physique development.com or at physique development, um, on Instagram. And then I do have a new cool creative project that I'm working on. Um, that I think Steve's Steve's seen, uh, that's at science of strength training on Instagram. So if you guys want to follow along and get an idea, this is a really good, actually, if you want to get a really good idea of what's kind of the book's all about, what's in the book, what the visuals look like, what the material and content of the book looks like. Um, if you type in science of strength training, on Instagram. That's, that's me. That's my new kind of creative project. Cool. Um, you, you know, trying to create more of an audience around just a community around more of the, the, the strength training realm that is kind of more for everyone that's, that's okay. detached from me, you know? Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few different places you can, you can kind of check out on Instagram. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, I'm following, uh, most of those um definitely yeah. following you and i'm following uh the the book essentially um is what i'm yeah. following there so that's cool i didn't realize that was going to be something bigger than even the book's going to be so that that's really cool that people can follow yeah along we'll that. see how it yeah we'll see how it builds um but it seemed to be pretty popular um you know and people seem to really like it and the coolest thing for me is i've spent obviously most of my career talking really about really niche topics and talking to sort of that, that 1%, right? The people who, you know, whether I'm helping teach a seminar or or whatever that is, or on Instagram, I I do kind of talk about more advanced things a lot of the time. And I, I really do think that the other 99% of the people who are in the gym are, you know, sort of underserved. They're, they're not really spoken to, especially to the depth of scientific rigor that the one percent are, right? And so I'm trying to to sort of creatively and and as an intellectual challenge to myself, pull myself out of that one percent and sort of entrench myself more into the ninety nine percent when I can with this creative project in the book, as sort of the driver to do that, um, to try and just do better to serve that that bigger population of people who don't really get taught as much, um, and if they're lucky enough to stumble across like your podcast or they're, they're lucky enough to stumble across like an Eric Helms of the world that they can maybe pick up a thing or two. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm just hoping to change that. I may do it. I may fall on my face, but damn enough, I'm not going to try. So, um, that's kind of my goal with it, yeah. you know, just kind of talk to just create a community, you know, and, and a place to come learn about strength training and all its benefits. Um, and something that's really given everything, uh, to my life. So that's really cool. Yeah. Props to you for that. Cause that Thanks, is man. challenging, but, uh, yeah. Again, yeah. We'll see. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, we'll trying. see where it goes. <laughs> yeah. We'll see where it goes. Well, I have to say a uh, massive thank you for this chat. It's been great. I think hopefully people will take a lot away from it. Maybe pick up a, a book hopefully as well. Um, and yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for coming on Austin. Absolutely, man. Hey, coming on is sort of like a, I feel like a stepping stone for your career. Um, it sort of like means you've reached a certain point, honestly. <laughs> like when you reached out to, to have me on, I was kind of like, oh, hell yeah, I'm excited. You know? Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. That I mean, so, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's very kind. And uh, thanks so much for having me on. Well, it, it's you only get asked on if I think you're doing amazing work and my stamp of approval means everything to everyone. <laughs> so, no, I'm, jo- I'm joking. <laughs> it means but, a lot but, to a lot of people. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you. Uh, it's, incredible to me that it could mean such a thing um and so i don't take that lightly either so um yeah yeah, i mean it like i said i've been wanting to get you on anyway and i'm really glad that it could work out like this so yeah it's been great chatting and yeah like i said i think hopefully a lot of people if they weren't already following you and following along and uh they will now so yeah that's all good
Yeah. Thanks, man. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're going to be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.